heaven's throne for us with eternity in mind to redeem the wounded soul to bring the way born of man he lived to die for his own Sacrifice our sin and shame, he washed away. Oh, the prize our Savior paid. To God be the glory, great things he has done, and all the earth sing his praise.
Hi Covenanters! Wow, so soon 2020 is coming to an end. You know, it has been an incredible year. Many of us wouldn't believe when we started off in January 2020 that within a few short months, our lives, not just in Singapore but throughout the world, will be turned so totally upside down. As we come to a close of 2020, I believe God is giving us an opportunity, regardless of what has happened in the months ahead, to finish 2020 well. He's giving us two opportunities. One, to bring our family discipleship higher. And number two, to bring our disciple making further. Hey Sarah, I remember we were chit-chatting and wondering how can we end 2020 well? How can we bring the young and old to end 2020 in a meaningful way? Then we landed on the idea of working for the nations to raise funds for the nations. And I realised it is not a new concept. Mm. It's something that we did nine years ago. Do you remember? Yes, I totally remember that. Such beautiful memories. Back in 2011, mm. I was only 19 years old. Mm. I remember Pastor Matt brought a whole bunch of us young people together who were just simply passionate about missions. We wanted to figure out what more can we do for the nations. And this idea of doing a sleepathon was birth. That we got the whole church involved in working to raise funds for the nation of East Timor. And little did we know that the funds raised from that walk was actually a seed fund that was later used for more and more young people to be able to have opportunity to get involved in missions as well. And that whole movement has lasted until today, which is something I'm so grateful for. And as I look back, I think what was most beautiful uh, about that walk was that it wasn't just a youth thing. It was something that generations could get together to do as one whole family, right? So kids all the way to elderly, right? And so I'm so excited that this year we actually get a chance to be part of that kind of historical milestone mm. again as one whole church family to finish well by walking for the nations and to love it beyond our shores. The pandemic has made many people feel lonely and long for listening ear. But you'll be asking, how can we connect with our family and friends given the restrictions on group meeting sizes? Well, the answer is simple. We meet them in small groups, in our own homes, and treat them to wonderful makan and meaningful conversations. Now, as the song goes, I'll be home for Christmas. As we have guests over in our homes for Christmas, we can share with them what the season really means to us. In the midst of the COVID-19 storm, Let's finish 2020 well. One reason why we are shooting out here in the great outdoors of Singapore is an invitation to bring your family and your friends out and together build relationships this December through Walk for Nations as well as I'll Be Home for Christmas so that we can together finish 2020 well. everyone, a big warm welcome to Covenant's Church at Home Service. We are so glad that you're able to join us for Church Online today. You know, whether we are at home or in church, we know that the Lord is here. So let's just take a moment now. Okay, take a deep breath, look around you and allow ourselves to be so keenly aware of that truth, that the Lord is here. Isn't that amazing? You know, as His church, Jesus calls us the light of the world. So as we worship today, imagine this in our minds. Okay, thousands of homes across Singapore and in the world right now get to be beacons of that light, carriers of His presence across our nation. So let's not be passive participants of service today, but be active worshippers of our King. So wherever you are, I invite us to now just stand to our feet to celebrate God's amazing grace as Karen leads us in a time of praise and worship. Let's sing about this amazing God Who breaks the power of sin and darkness Whose love is mighty and so much stronger The King of glory, the King above all kings Who shakes the whole earth with holy thanks King of glory, the King of 
So good. 
kindness of mercy that brought with love wholeheartedly my soul
who came in grace and truth How great the love that carries us to kindness Wonderful, you're wonderful So here I bow to lift you high Jesus, be glorified in all things For all my life I am yours forever yours Father, I just want to give you thanks and we celebrate your grace and goodness. We bow before you and we want to lift you high because we want to make this our one desire. That Jesus, you be glorified in our lives, in our church and in the nations. And as we continue worshipping the Lord together, I'm going to pause just for a moment right now and to give us some time to say a prayer of thanksgiving to God. So whatever comes to your mind in the next few seconds, will you just lift your voices in your homes and give thanks to the Lord with me. Father, just as you hear our thanksgivings, we know that you also hear the cries in challenging and difficult times. We pray for those in our church that may be taking care of family members who are ill, that you give them strength, rest and patience. We pray for those who may have lost loved ones recently, for your comfort and your peace to be upon them. We pray for those in Singapore who may have lost their jobs, that they will see your provision. Father, we pray for countries around the world that they are experiencing severe economic recessions or they are recovering from natural disasters. God, we pray that their national leaders will lead with hearts of wisdom and compassion. So God, we pray that for people caught in the middle of things like military conflicts or are displaced from their homes due to violence and unrest, we pray that you will be their shelter and that they will experience your loving presence once more. And so Father, we pray for even missionaries around the world who, who tend to the sick, who are doing a relief work uh, and to help the displaced, uh, at giving education to refugees and even bringing hope to the nations. We pray that you lift up their spirits this day and give them the strength to keep the faith and to keep showing your love every single day. So Lord, in all of this, we bring you our one desire once more, that you will be glorified in us, in your church and in the nations beyond. Give us the courage to truly be your light in the darkest of places. In Jesus' name we pray, Amen. 
You know, as we continue our time of worship, it's now time to give of our tithe and offering before the Lord. But before that, we want to have a special message from our church building fundraising committee represented by Owen C, Kelvin Chu and Denise Chua. They will be giving us a church building fund update and thereafter, the QR codes for our general fund and building fund will be appearing on the screen. Good morning, Covenanters. I'm Kelvin from Woodland Centre. And I'm Erwin from BPJ Centre. And I'm Dennis from East Centre. It's been six months since we last gave an update on the SID Fund. While COVID-19 has disrupted many of our lives and plans, we are very thankful many of us have been still giving to the SID Fund. Since September 2018 to December 2019, we have raised $14.6 million for the SID Fund. And in these last 10 months in 2020, you still gave some $2.1 million. That's amazing as various ones of us continue to fulfil our pledges. We are extremely grateful for the Lord's providence and all your generosity even in these uncertain times. I remember during a church service in the early days of the pandemic, Pastor Kei Kiong said something which struck a chord with me. He said that COVID-19 will pass away one day, but the Kingdom of God is here forever. The advancement of God's Kingdom here on earth is still marching forward. So we continue to trust the Lord to provide the 40 million seed fund target that is needed for the mid and long term infrastructure needs of the church, believing that with God, nothing is impossible. There are many uncertainties ahead, and the church leadership is praying and seeking the Lord on the way forward. For Covenant East, we remain committed to build a strong disciple making community in the East. As the church board and property committee will continue to study various possibilities, and opportunities of a desired church centre there. We are thankful for the completion of the Woodlands renovation and we look forward to utilising the facilities effectively as we continue to reopen. We are also continuing to evaluate the lease renewal of BPJ and its a and plans. As we seek the Lord for our next moves, we are stewarding all the funds already received critically. As these funds cannot be redirected to other users, the finance and investment committees are placing them in a safe financial instrument to preserve their value and potentially earn a better return than a simple bank deposit. So as we look to the Lord to guide us through the current storm, we also look to Him to provide for the future. Thank you and God bless. So Father, I just want to give you thanks for all that has been given so generously today. We give you thanks for all that you've given to us and this is just a little token back to you to say, Father, we are so grateful for all you have done in and through our lives. So God, with this little that we give back to you, we pray that it will be used for the extension of your kingdom. May it be a blessing to Singapore and to the nations beyond. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, so to all parents today, we are inspired by various testimonies of how the Lord has worked in your intentional family discipleship spaces ever since the start of this year from Circuit Breaker all the way to today. As Pastor Kei Kiong would say, keep at it! <laughs> so let's press on and finish well in 2020. Log on to the link at the bottom of your screen right now and you'll find discipleship materials you can use with your kids to have some solid faith conversations. For primary age kids, daily devotions are also available for them. So let's really encourage them to spend time with Jesus daily, especially during the school holidays. So now let's just get our Bibles and our journals ready and to be active listeners of God's Word. I would like to invite Reverend Bunny Lau to bring us God's Word from Mark chapter 14, verses 1 to 52. Hi, good morning to all of you. We are now four days into the Passion Week. Mark 14 and 15 describe the betrayal, arrest, trial, and crucifixion of Jesus. It's a series of events commonly known as 
the passion, which is the Latin word for suffer. Mark 14 is the longest chapter in the gospel, detailing the total abandonment of Jesus. Jesus entered Jerusalem in Mark 11. In our pulpit, that would be seven Sundays ago. Mark 14 is a dramatic and gut-wrenching chapter. We see the Son of God completely human, totally vulnerable and utterly abandoned by those He loved and came to save. Here is a broad sweep of how Mark chapter 14 verses 1 to 52 is laid out. Part 1 is verses 1 to 11, story of the devotion of an unnamed woman. Part 2 is verses 12 to 17, and it describes a Passover meal preparation. Part 3 is verses 18 to 31, the Lord's Supper and Peter's declaration of allegiance. Part 4 is verses 32 to 42, the scene in the Garden of Gethsemane. And lastly, in part 5, verses 43 to 52, the Lord's betrayal and arrest. In Mark 14, we get to witness the irrational display of an unnamed woman's devotion. We get to see the insidious evil of Judas's treachery, feel the inf infinite anguish of our Lord at Gethsemane, sense the intense drama at the Lord's betrayal, and walk in the Lord's indescribable loneliness of abandonment. I have two points from two perspectives to make in this sermon. First, from the perspective of a scandalous devotion. Second, from the perspective of a scandalous sacrifice. First point, a scandalous devotion. I read somewhere that the Clive Christian number one, yeah, the brand is called Clive Christian, Number one, Imperial Majesty perfume is probably the most expensive perfume there is, costing over $57,000 per 100ml. $57,000 is about the average annual salary of the average Singaporean. Who, what would ever possess anyone to spend that kind of money on a bottle of nice smelling liquid? What kind of body would even deserve that much to wear that kind of perfume. Well, such expensive perfume exists in Jesus' time as well. My first point is found in verses 1 to 11, a scandalous devotion. Verse 1 to 11 is what commentaries would call a sandwich narrative. The passage of emphasis is sandwiched, sandwiched in between two other passages that serve to point readers to the filling in our case here, to serve as a drastic contrast. Verse 3 paints the scene of the filling of the sandwich for us. Verse 3 reads, While he was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper and reclining at the table, there came a woman with an alabaster vial of very costly perfume of pure nut, and she broke the vial and poured it over his head. And so, verses 3 to 9 is the meat or the filling of the sandwich. This is contrasted with verses 1 and 2 and verses 10 and 11, the top and bottom slices of the bread of the sandwich. In verses 1 to 2, the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to seize him by stealth and to kill him. And they were saying, not during the festival. Otherwise, there might be a riot of the people. In verse 10, Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went off to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. They were glad when they heard this and promised to give him money. And he began seeking how to betray him at an opportune time. What is this? This is premeditated murder and high treason of the most devious and deceitful kind. See, there are at least three layers of contrast to highlight this emphasis. Contrast number one, insider versus outsider. You see, the town where the devotion took place was in Bethany, outside of Jerusalem. But the city where the devious plot was hatched was in Jerusalem, the city of God. 
The home in Bethany belonged to Simon, the leper, the lowest outcast of society. But the place where the treachery was contracted was either on temple grounds, the temple of God, or in the home of a chief priest, the man of God. The woman was unnamed and of unknown stature, and a woman. But Judas was an insider, one of the twelve. The master minds behind the devious plot were the high ruling council of Jerusalem, the priests of God's temper, temple, and the teachers of God's law. That's the first contrast. The second contrast is about appearances. Here, the woman crossed social boundaries. You see, in those days, only women who are serving can come to the table. So this woman disregarded judgment and ridicule to anoint Jesus. But the bystanders who had nothing to lose ridiculed her for frivolously, frivolously wasting perfectly good money when it could be given to the poor. The woman gave her best, 300 denarii worth of the best, a year's salary. Most probably, this vial of perfume was a precious family heirloom. Since women at that time had no career and they could not afford such expensive perfume. But Judas gave Jesus up for 30 pieces of silver. We read this in Matthew 26. And valued Jesus at the price of a slave. Four months worth of salary. The woman in one silent yet loud act anointed Jesus and reclaimed Jesus as a Lord. But Judas, with one sinister word, Rabbi, in verse 45, Sacrifice Jesus to the dogs. Contrast number three. Contrast number three is about knowing Jesus. The disciples were repeatedly forewarned by Jesus of his impending death. Yet no one, not one of his disciples say or did anything to prepare for his impending death. Not even in the last moments in the Lord's Supper, when Jesus said, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. Verse 18. But yet, a woman, an unnamed woman of unknown stature, understood and did what the disciples failed to understand and do. See, Jesus knew and accepted the woman's anointing as a preparation for his burial. You know, this, uh, this is an uh, Hermes perfume. Now, ladies, what is the most expensive perfume you own? I borrowed this 50 ml bottle of Hermes perfume from Jessie, my wife. She received it as a present some time back. And I checked it up. It retails for 130 bucks for, for one small little 50 ml bottle. You know, can you remember? The coin, this is a five cents coin. Our passage, unnamed woman's gift, is vastly different from the poor widow's might of two smallest coins in circulation at that time. Back in Mark 12, Pastor Kekong preached that two Sundays ago. See, this would be like our five cents coin, the poor widow's coins. No one wants to use a five cent coin. I used it in a, in a coffee shop and people gave me the, the dirty looks. <laughs> And yet Jesus commended the woman with the perfume and the poor widow with the two coins. He commended them the same. You see, to Jesus, an act only has value according to the value of the heart behind the act and not according to its economic value. No gift, not even the worthless five-cent coin is meaningless. Not, and no gift not even a year's salary is ever wasted. You know, Covenant have gone through four building projects. I was a fundraising chairman for one, the leading pastor for another, and the center overseer for the last one, which is still ongoing. But I, what I remember from all these building projects and fundraising are two stories. 
One was for our Woodland Centre back in 2007. An older seamstress covenanter in our Mandarin congregation came up to Pastor Patrick to give her her tin box. This tin box contained her savings. See, she did not have a bank account. This is a lot. This is for the lot towards the Woodlands building, she said. Pastor Patrick asked, why? Since it's her hard-earned savings as a seamstress. Oh, God has been so good. Covenant has been a blessing. I want to give it to the Lord, she said. The other story is back in 2012 in Bukit Panjang. After I gave a fundraising update on our Accenture property, a man who has been retrenched for a year then came up to me, smiling from year to year, all sweaty. He ran from ATM to ATM to withdraw money to give to the fundraising project. But you are retrenched. You needed the money, I said to him. He smiled back, all sweaty. He said, it's only money. I can earn it back. Says the man who was retrenched, who does not have a job. Says the man who walks 40 minutes one way every Sunday to and from church with a limp. Those are two stories I'll never forget. I have the great privilege of being a pastor in Covenant East. 30 to 40 Covenanters, volunteers to serve 200 to 300 meals every Sunday for three years until COVID hit. Young, old, women, men, cooks, non-cooks. No kitchen, no church budget, no shade over their head, all sweat, but only free food. Yet, they ran a surplus they serve out of their own pockets. Covenant East is reciprocated by donating into their tong tong box. And you know what? Even the tong tong box was donated. They were a noisy but joyful bunch. Every Sunday, you see these invisible words written on the visible smiles of their face. It says, I get to serve my God and love His church. Then there's the, the Covenant East tech crew. What can I say? These guys arrive before sunrise, before everyone else. They spend the next hour and a half moving big, heavy crates of equipment, sweaty, crawling around, laying wires, setting every single thing up for service. Every single Sunday, a thousand and one things would go wrong because everything has to be set up. All the wires and all the connection, things break. They are the last to leave church after everybody else have left. Almost seven hours in church every single Sunday. Not one peep of complaint these last four years. One of them said to me when I expressed my gratitude, he said, Pastor, this is family. I get to serve. You see, it's not the value of money. It's the size of the heart that gives the money that matters to the Lord. Both the untamed, unnamed woman with the extravagant perfume and the poor widow with her two copper coins. Both women's acts were scandalous devotions that only Jesus sees. But Jesus knows. Jesus understands. And Jesus honors. Now, on to my second point. Beyond a scandalous act, a scandalous devotion, is a scandalous sacrifice. It's been three days since they came into Jerusalem. Just two more days. Two more days to Passover. Passover is a significant day in the consciousness and conscience of every Jew, and rightly so. Passover was not just about deliverance of a people from oppression, but the birth of a nation, the birth of Israel. 1,400 to 1,500 years ago, God passed over the house of every Jewish slave who had the blood of the sacrificial lamb smeared on their doorposts. Yet, God took the lives of the firstborn of every Egyptian Israel oppressors when he came over. 
but he passed by the Jewish homes. That's the crux of Passover. God passed over the home, every home, with the blood of the sacrificial lamb on the lamppost. Passover was a time of great celebration and festivities for Jews in, in Israel and the diaspora of Jews all over. The story of Passover and the faithfulness of God is retold through the generations of every Passover meal. Once they were not a nation, but now they are. Once they were lost, but now they are saved. Jesus remembered that very first Passover well. He was there. He was there with God his Father some 14, 1500 years earlier. He remembered the awe in the faces of every Israelite and the gratitude in every Jewish heart when he passed them over. 1400 to 1500 years later, just two more days, two more days to the most unthinkable. Two more days and Jesus himself would become the sacrificial lamb for the ultimate Passover for all mankind. Anyone who would receive Jesus into their lives as Savior, His blood would be smeared on the doorpost of their heart. You see, verses 1 to 11 may be a scandalous devotion, but the rest of the 52 verses is about the scandalous sacrifice, the scandal of the Son of God being sacrificed. Verses 18 to 31 is another sandwich narrative. Verses 22 to 26 in this sandwich is the meat, the filling of the sandwich. And it's known as the Lord's Supper, or rather, Jesus' last Passover meal. Every sandwich passage emphasizes a point. So what is it for verses 18 to 31? See, when Jesus said, this is my body in verse 22, it meant my person, my whole being, my whole self. In Aramaic and Greek, respectively, the G Jesus' spoken language and the gospel's written language. That's what it means the whole body, the whole being, my whole self. The climax of the meal occurs when Jesus declared, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, in verse 24. In Hebrew thought, the life of a creature resided in its blood. Jesus' reference to the cup as my blood implies his very life, his very essence. So when Jesus broke it and gave it to them and said, take it, this is my body. Take it, this is my blood. Jesus, Jesus is telling his disciples that he's giving himself, all of himself, completely and unreservedly for them as the sacrificial lamb. In other words, the meat, the filling in the sandwich emphasizes the new Passover sacrificial lamb, Jesus himself, during the actual Passover meal. The top and bottom, bottom bread slices in verses 18 to 21 and verses 27 to 31 describes the disciples' betrayal and abandon, an abandonment of Jesus instead. Can you see the contrast? Can you see the irony? Jesus is God's covenantal faithfulness personified. And yet, this last Passover meal of Jesus was bracketed by descriptions of betrayal and abandonment. It should not be like that. It should be an intimate last meal with Jesus before He sacrificed Himself. You see, this is the scandal of God, a scandal of cosmic and infinite proportions. So that's what the sandwich is about. Don't miss it. The rest of Mark 14 simply shows how rapidly the disciples fall away. They all grieved when Jesus said one of them was going to betray Him in verse 19. They all ate of the bread that Jesus said represented His body in verse 22. They all drank of the cup that Jesus said represented His blood. They all confessed their allegiance to Jesus against His prediction in verse 31, but they all 
fled. They fled out of greed when Judas sold Jesus out. They fled out of weakness when Peter, James and John could not even keep watch with Jesus in his most vulnerable and intimate moment in the Garden of Gethsemane. They all fled out of fear when the religious rulers came with soldiers. They all fled out of cowardice when Peter denied Jesus three times. The unnamed woman's act to sacrifice costly, exquisite perfume is scandalous to men, but not to God. Because no matter how expensive the sacrifice was, it was finite, transient, and pale in comparison to the infinite, eternal, majestic worth of an infinite, eternal, and majestic God. But Jesus, at the sa- as the sacrifice, was scandalous on a cosmic scale because Jesus is God of infinite worth who gave himself up not only for finite beings that he created, but worse. He gave himself up for worthless, useless cowards who betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver, who abandoned him at the slightest sign of danger, who denied him at the mention of any association to him. Jesus, God himself came not to sacrifice himself for the worthy, but the unworthy. Not for the brave, for the cow, but for the cowards. Not for the sinless, but for the sinful. Not for the whole, but for the broken. I want to quote what one, what one particular theologian so profoundly describes this cosmic scandal of God when God gave us his best when he gave himself up for us. This theologian said, when God becomes man is in Jesus of Nazareth, he not only enters into the finitude of men, but in his death on the cross also enters into the situation of man's God-forsakenness. In Jesus, he does not die the natural death of a finite being but the violent death of the criminal on the cross, the death of complete abandonment by God, the suffering in the passion of Jesus is abandonment, rejection by God, His Father. God does not become a religion so that man participates in Him by corresponding religious thoughts and feelings. God does not become a law so that men participate in Him through obedience to a law. God does not become an ideal so that man achieves community with Him through constant striving. He humbles himself and takes upon himself the eternal death of the godless and the God-forsaken so that all the godless and the God-forsaken can experience communion with him. That's the sandwich of the Lord's Supper. The scandalous sacrifice that God himself, that God himself would die for us. That's God's best for us and to us. As I draw an end to my my sermon, I want want us to close our eyes. Yes. Will you please indulge me? Indulge me. Just close your eyes. Wherever you are, in a living room, on a TV, on a computer, just close your eyes. Just listen to me. Close your eyes. Now put on your sanctified imagination and recall the scene of the woman anointing Jesus. She is kneeling by Jesus' side, gently pouring out a precious family heirloom onto Jesus. That's all she had, her heirloom. But she gave it all to Jesus. Now in your mind, in your imagination, smell the exquisite aroma of this very expensive perfume. Smell it. Smell it. The scent is beautiful, fills the whole house, permeates the clothes, lingers in our noses. Our minds just cannot forget it, that scent, that aroma. Jesus was anointed with this perfume from the head down. This is the aroma of unfettered love. 
and unrestrained worship. This is the aroma of worship and love that accompanied Jesus through the rest of Mark 14 when He was betrayed, abandoned, denied, ridiculed, spat on, and beaten. Of course, it's speculation. But I can't help as I study the text of Mark 14 with all its emotions, I can't help but imagine that at Jesus' lowest point and loneliest moment, the lingering aroma of the perfume of the woman's devotion, it must have been a very soothing company for him, even the Son of God, because it speaks of love, it speaks of worship. I want to speak to two groups of listeners. The first group are Christians. My question for us is this. God gave us His best completely and unreservedly. He gave us Himself. What's the aroma of our worship and love for Jesus? Is it our 300 denarii worth, an heirloom worth? of perfume, our very best to the Lord, then when the Lord looks down, He smells that aroma, the aroma of unfettered love and unrestrained worship that will give up everything. Will you ponder upon that? And would you pray? Would you transact with the Lord? The second group are those who are not yet Christians or don't identify as one yet. My question to you this morning is this. What kind of God would sacrifice Himself so that we may have eternal life? Jesus is either God or He is crazy or He is a crook. But He cannot just be a good person. A man who said and did all these things that the Bible claimed He did would be a crazy person, the devil himself or he is God, but He simply cannot just be a good person. So if history and science cannot disprove Him or prove Him crazy or a crook, then the natural and logical conclusion is that He must be who He claimed to be. Jesus is God, but not the kind of God that you and I are used to. What kind of God would sacrifice Himself so that we may have eternal life? The only kind is the kind who loves us like parents would love their own children, regardless of how mischievous, how much problem, how bad the children behave. Parents will always love their children. Always! Why do you think that's the case? Because God made us. Parents reflect that love. Would you take that small step of faith to receive Jesus as your God. Even if you don't understand everything yet, but you will if you will let God show you. You can take this small step of faith by praying this short prayer. Very short prayer. I will pray first. You repeat after me for each phrase, okay? Here it goes. Close your eyes. Just listen and pray along with me. Dear Jesus, I hear about you today. I don't quite understand you yet, but I want to take this small step of faith. I invite you into my life as my God and my Saviour. Please forgive me of my sins. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, Amen. If you have prayed that prayer, then you have taken that small step of faith and you have become a Christian. Yeah, that's it. It's that simple. But the life of knowing Jesus starts from here onwards. And it's a lifelong journey and an adventurous journey. If you have prayed that prayer, welcome into the kingdom of God. On your screen, you will see a QR code. Will you scan that QR code? 
and fill up the form so that we can keep in touch with you and help you get started on this journey called the Christian life. You see, it's like cycling, you see. You need someone to help you get started with cycling. But once you know how to cycle, you know it for life. It's the same with the Christian life. For the rest of us, allow me to close us, close this sermon in prayer. Come, let's pray. Dear Lord, give me the scandalous faith of the unnamed woman who gave her heirloom perfume and the poor widow who gave her only two small, small copper coins. Because in your eyes, their hearts are filled with you. And I want that kind of a heart so that my discipleship will be an audacious and scandalous discipleship where I give my best, my all, my everything to you because that's what you did for me. In Jesus' name, Amen. There's a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. Where all the love I've ever found comes like a flood, comes flowing down. At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my Sin washed white, I owe all to you, I owe all to you, Jesus. There's a place where sin and shame are powerless. My heart has peace with God and forgiveness. Where all the love I've ever found comes like a flood, comes flowing down at the cross, at the cross. I surrender my life, I'm in all of you, I'm in all of you. When your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe all to you, I owe all to you. At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in all of you, I'm in all of you, when your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe all to you, I owe all to you, I owe all to you, I owe all Well, as you break up into your family or your CG, uh, I have a reflection question for you. God gave us His very best. God gave us Himself completely and unreservedly. So my question to you this morning is, what's the aroma of our worship and love for Jesus? What does it look like, practically speaking? Come, will you raise your hands with me? as we pray the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. 
and give you joy and give you shalom. Amen. Have a wonderful weekend.